comment on agenda items. I see we have a couple people here. No? No public comment? No? You're just going to sit there and listen? Oh, okay. Jesse is going to comment. Oh, you're afraid of mom. Okay. Let's move on item on. One. Mayor, uh, real quickly, too, the video, our videographer um, asked me to remind everybody to make sure that when you speak, that you speak into your mic with the little green light on. Um, it, uh, it, it doesn't just muffle your voice if it's not on. No, they don't hear you at all on TV if your mic's not on. So okay. if you want your comments heard, make sure you, I'll try to remind you, too. Yeah. You don't want to be heard. Yeah, yeah, if you don't want to be heard, just leave your mic. Okay, let's move on then to item number one, urban renewal report. Well, hello, Council. My name is Jesse Hill. I sit on the uh, board member of the Wheat Ridge Urban Renewal Authority, also known as Renew Wheat Ridge. And today we're here to present uh, our 2013 annual report. A um, little memo on it. Originally it was brought up due to some legislation going on, and uh, the board also thought it would be a good idea to put together a report that not only could present to you as a council the, the activities we've been going on for the last year, but also to the community as a whole. What does the Renewal Authority have? And something also that can say sit up on our the archives in City uh, Hall and on the web and also give a little more insight on what we do, the projects that happen that might span the memory of a uh, you know, meeting or might span the memory of even your terms here. Uh, a lot of our projects last for many, many years uh, from current idea to falling through and most of the plans themselves are are decades old so this is a uh, meant to be to work with it and uh, we ratified at our last meeting on uh, last Tuesday I believe so uh, the council the authority was formed in 1977 I'm gonna skip over a lot of the details here but a lot of times when it's presented to the community you know we're out and we say well, the Renewal Authority eliminates and prevents the spread of blight by investing in public improvements that are funded by a tax income and financing TIF. That is a great thing we do, but we also do a lot of other items and kind of included that in a list here. And I guess I'd like to remind all of you, Council, those are some of the tools that we have as a board and authority to help implement the plans. And those plans are passed by City Council and a lot of times a previous council or amended by you. So. We are ideally the implementation arm of the uh, renewal plans that are, exist out there. So, For 2013, we did have a great uh, and a busy year. Our main focus was uh, the marketing and blight removal of Town Center North. That's the property over at uh, 44th and Wadsworth. Um, the main items in that was uh, a variety of land sales and developments would included um, uh, included sales for the uh, apartment buildings that are currently up there for uh, senior housing. Uh, al going along with that, there was a, a series of uh, renegotiating loans that had happened with it. We had to acquire the property. We had to do a lot of improvements to it. Um, you know, we didn't know how long or where even that project was going when it started. So at the time came, and I think some of you might have seen it, renegotiated with loans and also some payoffs that occurred with that. Uh, we urged Cycrely back in 2013, we completed the TIF on that, um, that's good, so they've been funded back and the, the tax increment financing from that will now go into the uh, renewal authorities as we develop a plan in the future on how to fund those, to use those funds in future blight removal. So, uh, and besides that, a lot of uh, land sales up there on that. Like it was a busy year and negotiating and trying to bring in new tenants. It was a little more difficult than we thought to sell off some of those pieces of property. Market demographics was a big thing. We had people come in and say, hey, you know, we'd like to do it, but we really don't want to pay you anything. You know? <laughs> and uh, that's a tough one for us to, to swallow out there because we as a community have invested a lot of money in that corner and uh, currently under contract with um, the developers, Wazi Partners, uh, for, for some units up there, and it's always in an ongoing situation. So we'll hopefully see that finish up in, uh, this year. Other notable projects of 2013, Perrins Row, that is a series of apartments uh, over on 
townhomes. You are correct. Sorry. They were on 38th and Depew using tax increment financing from the property tax, which is a little different from what we normally do. A lot of times our TIFs are generated from uh, sales tax revenue. So that was another one that the board uh, worked through quite you know, diligently. Uh, and I guess that would be said about any of our projects. We definitely just don't stamp them through. We try and research and look through all we can at what's there and what's uh, best for the community if, and if there's some possible negotiations that can occur. So, Moving forward to 2014, wow, we're halfway through the year, but uh, the main things we, we really focused on was uh, 38th and Kipling. That was a big project. I think, again, you guys were aware and put some definite work into it also. Um, of some financing for the development there, 2.4 million. Also, we'll be uh, handling distribution around the $1 million economic incentive for that developer too, moving forward. Uh, 38th and Wadsworth was another one. Uh, you know, starting out, we haven't seen any approvals for any TIFs come through for that, but the work we have done and focused on was uh, acquiring some property um, to eliminate uh, uh, as a dry cleaner there. And so it was acquiring that property, cleaning it up, and, and kind of working through that development. Um, and overall, that's, uh, let's see, uh, did I hit on the major points, Mr. Art? You got them. All right. Well, I, I definitely would recommend, uh, you know, feel free to ask me any questions at the end of this. It's something that uh, I, I try and bring, I don't know, to the board, uh, a report that's find valuable. Hopefully you find it valuable. If you'd like to see additional things, let me know because we'd love to build on this in the future. And uh, any way too, we can improve the public process because I think it's important. Thank you, Mr. Hill. That was pretty informative. I see we have a council question here, Mr. Utorio. Thanks, Jesse, for coming in. Uh, the question that I had, and could you clarify for the public, because I'm sure people are watching, is that what property actually Urban Renewal owns at 38th and Wadsworth? There's a lot of rumors and innuendos that the city owns the entire site. Could you just explain who owns the property and what the city and Urban Renewal is involved in as far as the owning ownership? Absolutely. There was a single parcel, uh, Yukon and 38th there. It was uh, you know, one of these properties that gets stuck in interesting ownerships out there. So it was purchased from the Bank of Denver. Um, we're almost, you know, known. Uh, the previous owners had disappeared and left us a nice environmental mess. So the renewal authority purchased that property and is uh, in continuous um, environmental remediation of that piece. Uh, the plan is in the future to sell that off to the developer uh, without uh, losing, I guess, you know, at a, a fair market price. Um, and we've had a series of grants that have helped out with doing some of that environmental remediation in the meantime because it is a big risk to take on for development and that's one of your classic examples of blight that exists in a urban rural authority area of having an environmentally contaminated area who wants to touch it without knowing those risks so uh, as, as a authority we're able to do that a little more um, and bring in some tools to, to cover those finances and, and see that be remediated. And then the other question I had is, you know, over the last few years, the Urban Renewal Authority has had TIF financing for half a dozen projects, and really all those projects have been non-controversial. They've gone through the city council, the public, with little or no uh, acrimony. So I would encourage you to keep that open public process going, which has gone really well. The, the main thing I think that the Urban Renewal has to be careful of is that um, I think you're getting to the position where you can be a little bit selective and you can say, we're not gonna give a TIF for this type of project or this type of project because it's not what the community or the, the Urban Renewal Authority or, or the city needs right now. So I, I would encourage you to be a um, little bit more demanding on, on the future projects just because of the nature of the beast we're, we're growing and moving in the right direction. So thank you for all your work on that too. Absolutely, the goal would be to you know eliminate a removal of blight and the easiest way to improve the public process and to continue that involvement is to have us get these plans in earlier you know, so that we can review them, so that we have more time out there. And uh, that's probably the you know best way to really get that I don't know, full involvement of the board and community uh, that we can see. Mr. Starkley. Thank you, Madam Mayor, and uh, thank you, Jesse, for coming in. Nice report. Can you explain for me and for perhaps our viewing audience on Wheat Ridge Cyclery 
we made a, a, a TIF uh, agreement with them in 2007, and that's been paid off uh, early. And uh, we have a note in here that the, um, the project proceeds continue to be received by Renewal Wheat Ridge for an additional 19 years. Can you sort of explain to us how the, the sort of what the proceeds, what they're talking about, and what, what uh, happens to the money when it goes to Renewal Wheat Ridge? You know, absolutely. I'll, I'll give a first stab at it. I'll let Steve or Patrick fill in any blanks. But when the project really was first initiated, uh, there will be a baseline time set and, and also the value of current tax increment, tax that's brought in at that point. And so the beginning of the project, we say, Wheat Recycler, you've brought in this baseline level. Uh, once you start implementing these improvements, uh, the you know ideal scenario is that we are now seeing additional tax revenues come in to fund those items. So, say if you, I'm just using round numbers. Say they had a, a standard, um, you know, hundred thousand dollars of tax revenue. Did these improvements the next year? Uh, we did a hundred thousand dollars of improvement. Next year, ten thousand dollars additional comes in on tax increment. That's what's going to go back to refund. And one way to have this happen, there's a variety out there, uh, but to say refund that initial investment in there. We'll continue doing that until that $100,000 investment was paid off. Um, at that time, uh, the, uh, the initial um, TIF plan, or I guess the, uh, uh, the I guess TIF project would be financed, say, for 25 years usually. And so when you have that extra time, those additional revenues will come into further, it's not just that property, it's the surrounding area and properties around it. So we'll be developing a plan to, to invest those back in the community, continuing on forward to continue eliminating blight uh, within all the blight area, you know, possibly in that area or other areas around uh, Wee Ridge. Or that would be within the 38th Avenue corridor urban renewal plan area, the monies okay, could be so utilized. So is are those funds that are coming in from a successful TIF project because we've we've repaid the the tax increment that we had that we had been looking for the the business had had repaid that um, so those funds are, are uh, that tax increment continues to accrue to Renewal Wheat Ridge and is then available for other TIF projects in the in the neighborhood the city is there a geographical boundary on that next door or, or what's the so by law, just to, to get back up, uh, by law, um, an urban renewal, once we start the clock on receiving TIF, it's for a period of 25 years. So we paid off uh, the Wheat Ridge Cyclery project early, so we'll continue receiving those funds in. That revenue that is received in must be used within that urban renewal plan area, the 38th Avenue project, for any public improvements that the board deem necessary. It can be to assist a TIF project. It could be just to do improvements along that project area. Thank you. Ms. Wood. Regarding 38th and Wadsworth, I continue, and I'm sure others do also, continue to get phone calls and emails. Could you go over in general what the next steps would be on that property? So what the next steps coming up might be? Uh, you know, as a board, as we see it, it's, uh, you know, just from what we see, and that's, uh, we expect to see a TIF application come in from a developer um, that would include uh, plans in their public, you know, there might be a request in there, uh, assuming it's for TIF, for public improvements and other things that might eliminate blight. Uh, Steve probably can hit on exactly how and what that might look like or timeline, but as a board, we, we nothing has come in front of us yet so we we would expect something and if you remember the process we went through with the 38th and kipling that center there with the substantial modification this project will have to go through that same process of the substantial modification to them so it'll go before the planning commission to make sure it adheres to the comprehensive plan it'll come with a public hearing before the uh, city council and ultimately a renewal authority will approve a tiff request we have not received anything so at this point we don't even have a request on the table from the applicant on that we haven't seen a performer on there so at this point we can't really speak any more to that until we have an actual project mr fitzgerald Jesse, thank you. Uh, I'm just curious about this uh, $55,000 expense for professional services. Um, 
I presume that ha that has to do with the uh, remediation of the uh, blight at the cleaners? Actually, uh, more on the aspects of uh, our legal uh, professional services. Uh, our board is very lightly staffed and majority of our time and effort spent negotiating contracts, deals, uh, my questions and other board members and uh, whatever else we need to keep moving uh, in a legal and abiding path uh, of uh, acting as a renewal authority. So that's uh, the majority of those professional services are as our, our legal counsel. No more questions? Mr. It has an application. I was on the impression that on 38th and Wadsworth, an application had been filed within the, the staff. With the city. So is it quasi-judicial now? It, it is. Um, they've submitted, uh, the applicant has submitted a um, conceptual site plan, which is a first step, and uh, so it is a, It is in a quasi-judicial state at this point. So just for everybody, so council people cannot talk to each other or the public about it, but public can talk to public and we can talk to staff about it, but as of public can talk, well, they, the public can talk to us, but we can't really respond back. That's That's yep. been the... The next, the next step that council will see on that project it would be a subdivision plat um, to divide the property up. And um, I don't have a date on that yet. There's still, we're still back, um, back and forth on comments and referrals out to outside agencies. So um, that would be the next step with to answer um, Genevieve's question to um, to city council. Well, and the, the question I wanted to bring up is in general subdivision plats. You know, Mr. Stark and I were talking about this in general. Subdivision plats come for the City Council or Planning Commission, and it's not a rezoning, and they're very difficult in general to deny if they follow all the rules. And if what happens if uh, a council denies a subdivision plat, it's generally a lawsuit, and usually the city can lose the lawsuit. Generally speaking, if subdivision plats are not um, approved by council, is that true? It's it's yeah, it's very true. It's it's a very technical document that um, that council um, really doesn't have a lot of discretion in, in, in voting down unless they're not meeting those technical requirements. So the only two areas that we'll see probably is a subdivision plat in general, if the property's already been designed, and the TIF application. Does the TIF application go? TIF application will just go to the Urban Renewal Authority. What Steve mentioned, um, similar to 38th and Kipling, we have to amend the um, Wadsworth Corridor um, Urban Renewal Plan to allow for TIF to start. So that city council will see that, but you're not actually approving the actual TIF agreement. The Urban Renewal Authority approves a TIF agreement. So we didn't, we didn't approve the TIF on 38th and Kipling, we approved the- You amended the plan. the plan to allow for the clock to start. Now that could be denied. And that's, sure. not, that's not necessarily a, um, a lawsuit waiting to happen. Okay. Yep. Okay. Good evening. <laughs> it's okay. Uh, Ms. Davis has joined us. Um, are we through with our discussion on this? Do we need any action from us? No, it's just so that we got a review. Of, and thank you very much. Yeah, for information only. And I guess I'd like to thank council for sending us some great board members so far. And if we have any more vacancies, keep selling them. We're a diverse group of uh, businessmen and women and engineers and uh, all kinds of good good people. So uh, we've got a good solid board and we're excited for new projects coming up here in the year and uh, and future. So thanks again. Joyce, real quick. I just wanted to uh, extend a thank you to Jesse too because uh, Jesse, uh, you know, I know this was one of your things that you wanted to get done, and so I want to thank you on that, and thank Steve for, for the help as well. But uh, Jesse is a valuable member of the board, even, you know, as we're, um, he keeps us straight on finances, and, and he asks hard questions, so I also want to thank uh, Jesse as well. Item number two, um, the discussion on the council tablet possibility for council members to receive tablets. Did you want to discuss that, Patrick? Correct, yeah, sure. Um, Michael uh, Steinke is here, our IT manager. He is um, going to prevent some, or present some options to council. Um, we've been you know, talking about this for quite some time and finally had some time on an agenda to bring it back, but Mike's been, been prepared for, for months um, on this and has some information, so I'll let uh, Mike take it away. Turn the light, turn the green Mike, light. Mike, hit the mic. 
have two documents, or actually three to give you, but um, I'm going to leave the two more easy reading off to the side because that's going to distract. What you really want to look at is this sheet that I'm going to pass around, which is um, a comparison between the Surface 3 Pro and the iPad Air. You want to pass them out? Thanks. And I also brought a couple of actual devices with me that um, I would like you to just touch and feel and hold. Um, so one is the iPad. It's not the Air. It's not the latest, greatest, but it was one generation back. The new iPad is a little bit lighter, but same dimension. And this is the new Surface 3 Pro. So, most of you are, are most people are, are very familiar with uh, iPads. Um, they're uh, the very first tablet that was on the market, and now everybody is catching up to what iPad um, used to have the big market share on. What we're looking at is the Surface Pro is the recommended option for counsel, and the reason why is because one, it's a Windows machine, so it really is. It has a detachable keyboard, um, and it really is designed to run Office applications. So on an iPad, we can't load um, Microsoft Office, the full version. We can get readers and things to go on that, but not the full version. Um, the iPad also is a little bit smaller screen. It weighs about the same as the Surface Pro. The Surface Pro, um, is really the latest in technology. It's the third generation of this tablet from Microsoft. Like I said, it has a detachable keyboard and it's, it's a 12 inch screen. It's really nice, resolution is great on it. And from an IT perspective, one of the biggest concerns I had with Council having iPads was there was really no way for me to manage what goes on your iPad. Do you have antivirus on your iPad? Do you, you know, all the things that you need to look up council agendas. Um, the original discussion was, why are we using, why would we want to use iPads or any tablet? And it was to try to do paperless agenda packets so that you could mark up and do um, almost digital writing on your agenda packet documents. The technology with the Surface Pro 3 has progressed enough where even internally within the city, our, our staff, you know, selected uh, users on our staff and um, selected users in our IT division are testing these units out. And they are truly a desktop replacement. We see them as desktop replacements for people that need mobility and still want to have the look and feel of a Windows desktop environment. Um, the price point between the two, the Surface is $200 more expensive um, than the Wi-Fi only version of the Apple iPad. However, um, I really believe that that $200 is really, when you look at what that, iPad, that Surface Pro can do, is basically a really light tablet, laptop, and in about a month, Microsoft is releasing a docking station for it. So for our internal staff, um, we use a lot of multiple monitors because we've got spreadsheets up on one screen and you know other Outlook and email up on another screen. We will be able to dock that tablet and hook up to two monitors. And like for those users that have laptops today, we usually spend about $1,500 to outfit a person with a laptop. The Surface 3 Pro gives them the touch capability of a tablet, it's Windows, and they can take it and go. So here in the city, we've wired the city for wireless um, access, Wi-Fi wi access. So not only can our internal staff take their tablet to go, but they can have their email available in a full Outlook client anywhere in this facility, and also over at the rec center, and also over at the active adult center. Um, Internally, my plan for um, replacement of laptops is there will not be replacement of laptops in the future. We are going to internally, in our staff, replace them with these Surface Pro devices. 
Um, the docking station is $200. The device itself is $1,000. So you're looking at $1,200. I'm still kind of saving $300 over a laptop. And it gives folks like Patrick and management um, the ability to use a tablet and just undock their stuff and take it their office with them. So for council's use, the way that we envision it being used is we would set you all up with one of these city issued. Um, we would configure your email using a full Outlook 2013 email client, no webmail or anything like that. And one of the neat features of the newer software of Exchange and Outlook is that as long as you have a Wi-Fi connection, you can have it at your home, you can have it at Starbucks, you can have it here, you will receive in real time email. And you can respond in real time in email. And there's no extra logins or anything to, to get that Outlook client to actually work. Um, Tracy's not here today. We actually had her demo one of our uh, Surface 2, the first generation, which is kind of weird, Surface 2 versus what it won. But she demoed the first one, and um, the feedback from her was really positive. The only downside that she said was, ah, the screen was a little bit small. So this Surface Pro 3 is much larger. It's, it's a 12-inch screen. It's almost the size of a full laptop, you know, a small laptop. So I'm really excited to get this deployed in, in our organization internally. And um, if council wants to move forward this with, you know, deploying this technology, we have funds this year to do that. Davis. Mike, just one question. Um, coming from an, uh, a business or an organization that has a lot of meetings and a lot of meeting packets, we uh, use the Dropbox. Yep. And so have you researched, is that your role as well, or are you just hardware role? But I, I'm wondering if uh, what we would use as far as a way to get the packets to us instead of having it on the Internet. I think, you know, one of the eases is, is using, I think, so Exempla, you, or they're not exempt anymore, but the hospital uses the box, I think, because that's more security uh, round, and then you can get the drop box that's not security. Um, and those are all things that we could do on the Surface Pro. Yes, absolutely. It's, <coughs> it's like a desktop. It's like you're taking your desk with you. Now, one of the things that's, that's coming is um, we're, we're due for a server upgrade here in the next little while, and we're going to be going to server... 2012 R2, and what that allows me to do is it allows me through a wireless connection securely to give people access to something similar to a Dropbox, but it's really a, a network drive. Mm -hmm. It's yeah. just that it Like a is, shared drive. Yeah, it's a shared drive, but you don't need to physically be connected to our network here physically in this building. It'll act very similar to Outlook where it's just a, you know, a drive letter on your computer, and you, as long as you have Wi-Fi access, and we give you permission to get to that folder structure, that folder, uh -huh. um, you'll just, you won't even have to log in or do anything. You just double click on it, and okay. you're there. And so there'd be like a PDF that would say study session June twentieth or whatever today. It would probably be or July twentieth. Yes, it would probably be broken down very similar to the way the city clerk has their agen agendas broken down mm -hmm. right now in Laserfiche online for public access mm -hmm. where it's, you know, by year or by month and they would just yeah. dump okay. their documents in there for you to access. Because I think that's a lot easier than having to go on the internet and then go on and dig and find it. If there's just one place we could just boop, boop, boop. Yeah. Right now the way that it works is it, they are on the internet. So you have to go to our website yeah. and you have to click on the link and, and you I download have to put the in my document. IBooks and, and you have to put in, yes. So with the Surface, you go to our website you click on the PDF and you save it to your desktop and you're done. And then you open it up and do whatever you want to do with it. Um, I think it's a better, even the, the web interface today is better than Dropbox because, you know, what are we trying to secure? Or, you know, the agenda is a public document. I think it's just I mean, easy to get to it. You know, like. Well, Dropbox, you have to log in. So there's another set of usernames and passwords you have to remember to get into the Dropbox, if you're using the secure version. Yeah, but you could, right? yeah, you could. If you're do not that, using the secure then version. Then you could just pick Yeah, it you up. just double click on it where you go. But Mike, we could also just, we could just email the PDF to them, right? And they just, they could save, or 
download it from yeah. the email. Probably team, right? would be the most because depending on how big the agendas are, I've seen agendas that have been you know 200 megabytes that have all kinds of drawings and pictures in them, and those are just not going to go through email. Um, you know, rule of thumb is 10 megabytes or smaller for email, okay. and that rule is even kind of creeping up on us. But um, you know, going to the website today is probably the most. I think it's the most efficient way to do it especially on a, w a desktop or a Surface device. But we can do both. We can do inbox and we can do, you know, there's lots of options. Or even like an email or it's yeah. like if you have An email with the link embedded in it that yeah, you, you get the email, it says yeah. here it is, you click on it and it takes okay. you there. Yeah. Can you remove your emails as you, as you click on them? Say that again? Same system to remove, delete emails, et cetera. Yes. Yeah, it would be our Outlook system. Uh, what about the extra papers, the uh, charts, graphs, maps, et cetera, plans that we look at? How would you handle that? If they're large, you know, 36 by 24, inch, we would have to print them out. If, I mean, if you're wanting a paper copy, because even on a laptop, looking at those larger plans, it's very difficult. Now, one of the things that um, is coming up that may happen, well, we're planning on having it happen next year, is council chamber is going to get remodeled with um, like a document imaging screen so that we can put a large plan down and it'll project on a screen so everybody can see it, the same thing and then you can go over there and mark it up, write it up and do whatever you want. But, you know, today what we do is we print out everything, right? So if there's a big plan in there, you get a copy of it. There's just no choice. Um, that would probably still be the case for large plans. I don't. I, I have a I have a fair amount of experience with large plans, and what you know, you can either view the whole the whole sheet on your little on your little screen, and if you want to if you want to see different parts of it, then you just you just blow it up to 100 percent or 150 percent or whatever, and go around the document, and and then you can really read the detail in the document. So, um, that's that's not. Not really a problem at all. No, no. It will it will give you a clear, uh, you know, in a in a PDF format, a very clear clear image, and uh, you know. So. That, and that's something we can work through too. I, like I think Bud's right. Some people might have more experience at looking at maps on on a small screen and or large documents, and so those people may not need a hard copy to start with. But until you get used to it, we could we could still print out some hard copies, but. I would agree. It's really a user preference thing. Um, it's just, you know, sometimes paper is a little bit easier. Other questions or discussion? Okay, do we need a consensus on this to go forward? Yeah, if, if, if you would like to move forward, um, we yes, we would like to hear that. Yeah. And if, if you like staff's recommendations. Um, I, I I, th I think it's I think it's a good uh, value for us to be able to particularly uh, save the um, save the printing costs, and I hope that it would go along with you know that that would be part of the thing is that we don't get packaged, you know we don't get packages uh, delivered, so we would save the cost of delivery, we'd save the cost of printing, um, and I would make a consensus that we move forward with that. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Urban. Um, I would say as long as we have that understanding that if you do receive one of these, you're not going to get a delivered package, that there's an either, you can't get it delivered and also have this, that there be some understanding of that. A person could individually print their package? If they chose. Sure, if they that chose off of the internet actually, off of their regular computer? Yeah, we can't right. stop you from doing that. And, and I guess one, you know, sort of, I, I would certainly concur with that. And, and one more requirement would be some training <laughs> so, so that we have, uh, you know, we're able to, able to get them up and running and, we're, and really to be uh, fully functional. Anything else? Are we in agreement on that? Any dissenters? No? Nope. Sounds Good. like we have a for going forward on. Great. Thank you, Mike. Thank Appreciate you. it. The last thing is we need a list of who wants and who doesn't. I think everybody for, yep, I think everybody. Oh, okay. So, yeah. Well, that's easy. Yeah. Easy yes, enough. it is. Thank you. Thanks, Mike. Appreciate Thanks, Mike. it. <laughs> like I said, here's a couple of documents. 
What's that? Colors. You can. I'll talk to Mike. If you, if you want a specific color, we can. Then you can tell them apart at least. Yeah. You all have to get a different color. Yeah, we'll send options around for you. We'll do that. He wants the purple, probably. Okay, thank you, Mayor. Um, I don't have a PowerPoint presentation this evening. Hope you're not too disappointed. But um, we can uh, walk through my memo. And, and uh, Mr. Schultz, uh, our city treasurer, has also um, provided um, his quarterly, I think he does it quarterly, don't you? His treasurer's reports. So, um, but I'll just walk through some highlights of, of the budget report. Um, this is a, a budget report for the six months, um, first six months of the year, ending June 30th. And, and city charter does require that um, I provide a, an update and presentation um, on the sixth month um, budget uh, review. Um, if you go to the second page, uh, the first chart um, shows our different revenue classifications um, and how, how they're com coming in based on, on what we projected. So it's a, it's a pro-rated pro -rated, um, analysis, uh, again, to determine um, if revenues are coming in as projected. So if you, as an example, you look at sales tax, we, when we adopted the budget, we projected um, just over $16 million in revenue. Um, on average, oh, based on, on a historic average, um, we should be, we should have about 6.3 in of revenue from sales tax by the end of June. Um, the third column, or the fourth column you see is, is what we actually do have in um, through the end of June is, is just over $8 million. So um, we are $1.7 million over what we expected um, to have um, in by this year. Um, and then you, the the column on the very far right is the percentage. Um, so we're 128% of what we projected. Um, now there's one big caveat in this, um, in our sales tax number, um, uh, sales tax, sales and use tax audits are included in this number. And we had a very large audit this year, um, which brought in $1.7 million. So um, a good chunk of that, well, pretty much most of it. Once, when you pull out the, um, that, that sales tax audit, um, just general sales tax in general without, that, without audit revenue is up about 1.9%. So sales tax revenues um, are still up um, when you do pull that out. Um, and then you can go down through the other categories. Um, everything is, is, is pretty, pretty much up, um, which is a good news. Um, other, our other taxes, use taxes, licenses, intergovernmental. Um, the only two categories of revenues that are not um, meeting projections are um, service revenues and fines and forfeitures. They're a little bit down. Um, so our total general fund revenues are um, about at 119% um, of prorated revenues. So um, doing, doing fairly well um, with our revenues. Our total revenues are about 2.1 million over what we projected. So again, if you pull out that 1.7 for that audit, um, you know, we're about three to 400,000, a little bit more than we projected at this time of the year. So, so good news on that. Um, and then you look at our expenditures at the bottom of the page and, and the top of the next page, kind of do the same analysis for our expenditures um, based on historical averages of, of what we typically spend in each department by the end of June. Um, most departments are um, um, below of what we, usually spend. Um, the biggest two departments, community development and parks and rec, there, there, there are reasons for that. Community development, they have a, uh, the Brownfields EPA grant still, and um, they haven't spent much of that yet. And then also in parks and rec, um, they're about 400, almost 400,000 less than what um, is expected by this time of the year. And a lot of that has to do with um, park maintenance and utilities because of the wet spring um, and cool, cool spring and cool s summer, ex except for today. Um, so that money is going to probably get used by the end of the year potentially, but um, didn't have to use as much water and, and um, electricity so far at the beginning of the year, so we've saved some, some costs there. So overall for the general fund, we're at about 96% of what we expect it to spend by, by mid-year. Um, let's see. And then the top of the next page, this is just a straight analysis of 
this year's revenue is compared to last year's. Um, it's, not it's not based on what we projected to bring in, but just a straight comparison to last year. Um, same, same revenue categories. Um, you can see that uh, sales tax compared to last year for the first six months is up about 28.9%, but again, um, a good chunk of that's from that audit. Use, other taxes are up 14%, use taxes up 11. Licenses are down nine. Um, I do have some explanations um, at the bottom of the page on, on these different categories, which we'll go through. Um, intergovernmental re revenue is 16% up, services down about 14, fines and forfeitures up a little bit, and other up about 118%. So overall, in general, our total revenues are up about 20.6%. Um, but again, that includes that 1.7 million for that audit. Um, so licenses, I'll just go through the, the ones that are, are seeing some decreases. Licenses um, are down about 9%. That's primarily due to a decrease in building permits this year. Um, last year we had um, an extraordinary number of, of building permits by this time of the year. Um, uh, we have quite a few, quite a bit this year too, but um, last year was just a, a very busy year with building permits, and I think the second half of the year we're probably going to, it's probably going to see an increase in that some more. Um, service revenues are down um, about 14 percent, and that again has to do with um, uh, building um, type activity. Um, our zoning application and, and plan review plan review fees are down compared to last year. Again, last year was just a very busy year. A lot of those projects that we're seeing con being constructed today, um, a lot of those started last year and, and they, they paid their fees last year. Um, so those are kind of the two biggest ano anomalies there. Um, the last section of, of this report just talks about supplemental budget appropriations. Just want to make you all aware that um, we have made some significant um, budget supplemental appropriations this year. Um, and uh, a lot, of, uh, big chunk of those are for the uh, um, 32nd and Youngfield widening project. Um, let's see. We, uh, yeah, the 38th and Kipling development project. We uh, appropriated a million dollars for that project. Um, we paid down the loan at 44th and Wadsworth that Jesse Hill um, mentioned earlier. That was about 1.3 million dollars, I believe. Um, 38th Avenue Corridor, we just appropriated 750000 for um, engineering services. So there's been quite a few um, large appropriations this year, but um, if you remember, I think my year-end update that I gave to you, um, we saw just about a million more dollars um, that was contributed to our reserves at the end of last year than we expected, so that was helpful. When we paid down the loan at 44th and Wadsworth, that released about $450,000 of money that was tied up um, as cash collateral um, against that loan. So that money was released. We had that audit um, that came in at $1.7 million. So we've had some significant amounts of additional cash added to our reserves. So w when we, I, I looked at all of the uh, supplemental budget appropriations we made um, so far this year, we're still at, um, we're still meeting our minimum reserves um, but we're right now at about 18% um, after we've made all these these additional payments. So um, looking pretty good. The trends are up. Um, that's kind of it. If you have any questions, I'd be happy to answer those. Yes. I have just a quick comment. So uh, w one of the reasons, um, well, actually, it was interesting because a request was made for this information. Um, with the thought that it, it's not out to the public. Uh, but it does sound, I mean, we do get this annually, this six month report. And I think the other thing is, is a timely, uh, we uh, had on the agenda, the urban renewal report, which was timely uh, yeah. based off of the question. But I think if perhaps that's per the perception and, and because you have to catch the appropriate council meeting to make sure you get this information. Will this be posted on the website anywhere? It will be, and, and to be fair, we yeah, I think we've been lacking a little bit in the last um, year or so of getting stuff updated on the website, so this will definitely be up on the website, um, and the urban renewal report is. And one other thing, too, that was mentioned, I think, at a council meeting. Um, was the investments. Um, that, yeah. too, and Mr. Schultz has an update on that, but um, the, the CAFR, the 2013 CAFR, 
Um, we're just finalizing that. Um, it's not due to the state until the end of this month. And um, actually, it's on your agenda for presentation by our auditors. I think your next meeting, um, July 28th. Yeah. Um, but that, you know, Capper, we don't we don't close the previous financial year until March or April, um, and the audit is just wrapping up and getting finished, and um, we're still proofing the final documents, and um, it should be ready by July 28th, though. Thank you. If I, um, Patrick, if I, um, if I heard what you said was that we're at, at an 18% minimum, our minimum reserve is 17%, we're at 18, so we're just 1% over that. But the question I have is are we in actually no better shape as far as our road and maintenance work that needs to be done? capital improvement that we need to be done. Yeah, correct. Um, we have not, you know, all, uh, most of those transfers we made this year using our reserves were for special projects, um, 38th and Kipling, the 44th and Wads, 38th Avenue, um, so they didn't go to our capital budget necessarily. Um, so we still don't have the funds um, in our general fund reserves to transfer to for capital, um, annual capital projects. And, and what we're transferring to, the supplemental budget appropriations, they are attempts at, um, not attempts, <laughs> that sounds weak, but they are, the, the process is to try to improve our general fund as far as creating economic development. Exactly, yeah. I mean, I, I think there were um, wise investments, invest investments in right. the community for sure. Okay, that's what I needed. Yeah. Any other questions? Larry's got, uh, I think, an update on, yeah. on the um, investments. Okay, um, I didn't bring extra copies of this, so... Um, in their packet. It's in the packet if you have the packet. Um, I just did now notice one error on, the, on this report, sorry to say. 2017, I know we're earning interest on that $500,000, but it is not here. I'll get that corrected, obviously. Uh, in making investments, the top three items are maintaining cash flow for the city so we can pay our bills and not have to um, pulling your investments back early and paying your penalties. Glad to say we've not lost any money. We have not lost or paid any penalties because we've never had to do that. Uh, when I buy CDs and bonds, I buy new issues and intend to keep them to maturity unless in the case of bonds they are called. Uh, CDs are all kept to maturity. None of our CDs are callables. So right now we have a pretty stable investment portfolio. Uh, at other times it's been more churning going on because of calls of bonds and uh, that sort of thing. Um, I, tr I don't buy bonds that with any more than one possible call opportunity. Uh, some bonds are sold, the interest rate sounds good, but it can be called at any time. And when we did some of that, Believe me, they get called at any time, and every other month you're returning that money. So at this time, we don't have that churning going on. Um, we are high on CDs. Uh, we have over six million invested in CDs. Those are in both uh, PDPA, or what we'd call conventional CDs with PDPA banks, and the negotiable CDs, which um, we got into because our PDPA banks aren't taking money. Uh, today, the five-year CD rate at First Bank is 0.9%. And uh, our other CDs are, are at higher rates. And lately, bonds have come up to around 2%. So if I had money to invest now, we could get some 2% money. You'll notice I don't have anything yet coming in in 2019. So I have not placed any, any funds yet this year, uh, mainly due to the cash flow. Um, we have been able to restore our reserve. That's the $2 million in liquid savings. That's at Solera National Bank, and they're now paying 40 basis points, which compares to the, uh, if you're familiar with them, the, uh, what am I trying to say? The, uh, cooperatives or like the folks who do just public holdings are paying like 12 basis points now. Um, so 
College Trust is one of those. Uh, CSAFE is another, and that's what they're paying. And that's about what FIRST gives us on money in the checking account. Uh, so these are the totals. Uh, the rates have been horrible. We've had to buy, uh, we bought bonds at less than 1% um, because that's where the rates are. All of this is protected. The bonds are backed up by the US. Uh, all of the CDs are covered by FDIC. None of those is over the $250,000 limit. And normally buy 245,000 and that allows for the earnings on top of that to stay within the $250,000 maximum. Fortunately, we have no experience with FDIC covering anything. Uh, and I hope uh, we never do. That doesn't happen often. Um, but that's our situation right now. Uh, we have a little lower in invested funds than, uh, than we have at some times in the past. And um, I'm hoping we'll be able to increase that a bit. Um, so that's the facts. I apologize for that error. I will get that corrected and, and get this out to you. Um, we do have an investment committee. We have an investment committee meeting tomorrow. I should mention um, there has been a change in the CRS pertaining to um, municipal bonds or special district bonds. Uh, the law says we may not buy those for longer than a three year period. And the new law says that it has to carry a rating, the top rating with two rating agencies. Uh, that was just passed in the last legislature. Uh, so we are reviewing the, count, the uh, policy and will shortly be coming to council with that policy as revised. Uh, we'll be, of course, running that through legal and all those things. So uh, that's it. Mr. Urban. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, you mentioned that uh, the city currently has some funds in, uh, being held by Solero National Bank. Um, is there any concern? I know recently their CEO was fired or- We're watching that, yeah. And the former CFO is now the new CEO. That just happened. Uh, no, we don't have any reason to be concerned about the funds. Uh, they're having a battle over who's gonna run the bank. Uh, but it is a PDPA bank. Uh, they have funds to uh, indemnify or collateralize uh, the money we have with them. I just wouldn't write that. that well, I understand that I'm not surprised if someone would ask, but we're staying close to that. Other questions? I guess we're done with that report then. Thank you, Mr. Schultz. You're welcome. Very much. Thank you. Mr. Goff, we can move to uh, staff reports. Yeah, I have just one quick one. Um, we, we talked about this a while back. This is a donation request um, for the Arvada uh, Community Food Bank, Arvada Wee Ridge Community Food Bank, they should call it. Um, this is their top hats and ball caps events, which is scheduled for October 11th, 2014. Um, they have contacted me again several times um, asking if, if, if we'd be interested in, in donating. Um, I think on the second page there are some different suggested donation donation levels but um i don't think you're bound by any one of those but um it is and if you remember the, the arvada community food bank just changed their boundaries not too long ago to include the entire city of wheat ridge so um, this is a fundraiser for for that food bank is there any interest in in f providing a donation to this event And Ms. Wood, I don't know if you mentioned this before. Have we donated to this before? And if so, how much? I don't believe we have. And I think this may be their first event, actually, this type of event like this. Um, Mr. DiGiulio. Patrick, does our Feed the Future Backpack Program interface with this group at all? Do, do we get some of the food from the Arvada it, Food Bank? We do, yeah. So are we giving them money from that group, from the Feed the Future? Is that, could we give $10,000 a year 
from the city. Is, some, is that some of that money making back to this group? The the money we give goes specifically to f feed the future, so it it provides the food for um, our schools, local schools. But, and directly. we're not buying it from them, from our bad food bank. We're not getting it from them. I think the food comes from them. Yeah, but. But yeah, yeah. So the funds, but the, this, the Arvada Community Food Bank does more than just the Feed the Future program. Um, so I think that this is a fundraising f fundraiser for their entire programming, not just the Feed the Future. But you're right. We do. We do. do well, I was just wondering yeah. if some of the some of the money we indirectly goes from the Feed the Future program into their food bank and their money bank as far as it goes. Yeah, any, everything that we give, if we give them the ten thousand that we've been giving them on an annual basis. Um, pays for the food that comes back to our schools, kids. One of the bullets does say something about backpack program. Ms. Davis, you had a question? Yeah, so I was just wondering, because obviously this isn't budgeted. Correct. Uh, so I'm just wondering if this is something, again, that we could each, uh, you know, use some of our outreach funds. I, I'm happy to do so. and. Um, I mean, I think, I, I'm not sure about the event, but you know, sometimes it's, you know, the cost of the event and having people there and giving them money for, to feed us and, you know, for the event part of it that maybe we could even give close that amount just in money and not the event. Yeah. Mr. Fitzgerald. I'm certainly happy to give something from my fund. Uh, but we could also, I mean, since now this bank is going to feed our citizens as well, maybe we ought to step up more, uh, with more than just our own individual funds. What do you think? I don't know. Yeah, Mr. Detoli. Um My funds are pretty low right now, so I wouldn't be able to contribute to my public outreach, but I wouldn't mind, based on Mr. Fitzgerald's suggestion, 1000 or 2500 from the city. It'd be a budget amendment, but I think it's worth it because I don't want to be a peer like an isolation of city. I mean, this this group does support Wheat Ridge Arvada. It's we're all a community, and so if we go a thousand or a twenty five hundred budget amendment, I'd be okay with that. I just don't have any more to give from my public outreach. Mayor, they, I did receive a note too from um, this organization. They said they've also submitted a grant proposal to the Colorado Health Foundation for a three year grant to fund Head Start in Wheat Ridge and Arvada with weekend sacks of food. Um, they said if they get that funding, it will free up funding for the Feed the Future Backpack Program so that we may be able to pick up another another school in Wheat Ridge. So just some information. Which we were trying to do. So the council be okay with 1,000 or 2,500? So we're looking, the, the idea is that City would provide a thousand or twenty five hundred, and then individuals could add to that as they wanted to. Is what I'm hearing, yeah. Mr. Fitzgerald. Did you have something specific? Oh, I was just, I, I, I like twenty five hundred more than I like a thousand, yeah. but I'm not going to be here next week, so <laughs> <That's fine. laughs> it's up to you guys, Ms. Davis. I think that this would. I too would support the budget amendment for 2500 because it, it will come back to the community and it sounds like if they get that grant, it would come back to support other programs within our city. Right. So. Mr. Urban. Have they already applied for that grant or are they in the process? They of have, so they don't know yet. Yeah, they, they're waiting to hear. I was hoping that by our commitment yeah. to donate a certain amount of money that, that would help for they said they just submitted, so maybe they can. So, I'd be in favor of the 2,500. Sounds like it. Okay. I, I personally toured, toured the Arvada Food Bank. It's a very, very worthwhile cause. A lot of volunteers doing a lot of good work there. So we look like what we're doing is a budget amendment of $2,500 plus anything additional that any council member would like to give. Please notify Mr. Goff since Janice is out of town right now would that be okay with we'll say within the next week so we have a total amount that we know about is that good that's good thank you very much they'll be happy okay any see that was staff reports nothing else on that one nope elected officials reports let's just go around the table larry do you have anything else no mr urban 
I'm good. Thank you. Just wanted to thank Teller Street Gallery last night for hosting the Feed the Future program. Uh, it's good seeing some council members, elected officials, mayor, and then also we had a lot of community support. So thanks to Teller Street Galleries on 38th Avenue. Mr. Fitzgerald? Um, nothing. Nothing. I will just uh, echo my uh, fellow councilor from District 1 to uh, thank Teller Gallery and all of the uh, citizens who worked hard to, to put the F Feed the Future um, program together yesterday. It was a great, great time, and I think it made some, um, some good funding uh, for that well-deserved program. Thank you. No, Bud, but one of Pilates uh, under the door price. Right? I thought you'd be at your Pilates after, after, after tonight. <laughs> Ms. Davis, sounds like that's it. Um, oh gosh, there's so much going on, but we're going to meet, close the meeting at uh, 7:30 tonight. We're adjourned. <laughs>